Be fruitful. Welcome to another session as we discover the fascinating world of the starfish. And this time, it is going to be really interesting because it's about money and work. We call this Kingdom Economics, the rediscovery of Kingdom Economics. It is an interesting insight, at least, to find out that Jesus was speaking more about money and work than about heaven and hell, almost as if it is important. <laughs> And what we have found out so far is that the way we deal with money and work, with the things of this world, demonstrate clearly beyond the shadow of any doubt where our priorities live. In other words, if you tell me how you deal with money and work, I tell you what you really believe. <laughs> in other words, our behavior in the area of finances and how we deal with work and things is the best and probably the quickest and safest thermometer of our true spirituality. In other words, if we look at how Christians deal with the things that God has been giving us, then we know to what degree our priorities are aligned with the kingdom of God. Now, one of the most amazing things throughout church history, throughout church history was that not only uh, was the gospel of the kingdom taken away from the Christians and the apostolic prophetic foundations. It was also the financial revolutionary system that Jesus has been living and preaching in this world. And people basically said, now we have advanced, we have evolved, we have become better. We're not like these funny people in the early church who even shared all material possessions. Today, we are far from that. We have social security now, we have insurance, we don't need these things anymore. But funny enough, it seems that the message that Christians have to the economic world is not at all powerful. It almost seems as if we have become one and the same with the world. The Bible quite clearly speaks about two systems, black and white, the domain of darkness and the kingdom of God. In the domain of darkness, uh, one of the classical cities that uh, symbolically uh, model it is the city of Babylon. That's why we call it a Babylonian system, if you wish, a materialistic uh, concept of buying and selling and prostituting yourself on the market. And if that kind of uh, system runs, everything becomes shaped by Babylon or shaped by the spirit of the market. Jesus once said, didn't he, you cannot serve God and mammon. You will either hate the one and love the other, but you cannot do both. But many people believe that you can actually do both. You can dance at two weddings at the same time. Do kind with mammon and do kind with God, and somehow come out looking good. It's not true. And one of the things is that I believe the devil has been very effectively been lying to the Christians about the radical economic system that God has brought into this world. If you look at it from this perspective, we could say if there is the fallen world and there is the kingdom of God opposite of each other, imagine like a little a table, uh, then one thing in the world is what is its highest value? What's the world all about? What's the biggest thing in this world? And the answer is it's the maximization of gain. Make money and make a lot of it. That's what it is. And if you look into the kingdom, What's the biggest value there? And it surely is not to make money and to make a lot of it. The biggest of all is love. <laughs> so you have love on the one side and you have maximization of gain on the other side. In the world, in order to make as much money as possible, you have to have an operation system that basically makes sure that you get as much money as possible. And that's called competition. You need to compete with others, be faster, quicker, and more colorful, and more in the face of others, quicker at the market than others, so that you have a bigger and better share of it. In the kingdom of God, the operation system 
that maximizes love, not money, is selfless service. <laughs> that you serve others without having a self-interest in it. Selfless service. This is the highest value, if you say, if you wish, in the kingdom. So you have two different systems. One is about maximizing gain through competitiveness, and the other one is to maximize love by multiplying selfless service. And therefore, if you try to mix those two things, it is almost like mixing water with oil. You can try to mix it, but you need a lot of energy until you become tired. Many people, if, if you watch it, specifically after the financial crisis that we have experienced, they want to look at Christianity to save Babylon from sinking. So the business world talks about flat structures, about vision, about mission, about values, about ethical marketing, and so on and so forth. And so they want to use things from the kingdom to support Babylon. I don't think it works long term. And some people in the Christian circles, they want to use business strategies, be more competitive, have your logo in the face of the people, be more punchy, be more strategic, and they want to maximize membership, maximize churches, maximize influence, maximize radio time, maximize sales. And do not recognize that they use Babylonian principles and think they advance the kingdom of God. It does not work that way. So the best and initial insight into the whole subject of kingdom, kingdom economics is this. There are two economical systems in this world. One is a Babylonian system that the whole world is functioning under, and the other one is the financial system of the kingdom. I told already that when Jesus came uh, as a king, he established a kingdom, and every kingdom that wants to really run well needs to have a financial system, a banking system, a way how to deal with money and work and things. And quite obviously, uh, the early Christians have demonstrated exactly the message that Jesus brought with him. Uh, however, if you look at today's behavior of many who call themselves Christians, you basically see that their lifestyle, their way of dealing with money and work, smells only of one thing, of the very same thing that you find in the world. It is not an alternative. Many Christians build on the same materialistic false securities that the world builds on and believe they are safe. That's called the deceit of riches. <laughs> And that's what many are doing. And that's what many financial advisors are even telling you. Have you seen a, a TV series on win your financial freedom? And what it is, is how to give, uh, how to make a tricky business deal in such a way that you have a million on the account and you live off the interest happily ever after. And you're financially free and independent. Friends, this has nothing to do with the kingdom. In the kingdom, Freedom is not that you can do what you want, with whom you want, if you want. Freedom actually is a close voluntary relationship with your liberator, Jesus Christ. Where you are not free to do as you want, but you are actually free to do as you should. And that's a total different kind of liberty. And even in the kingdom of God, uh, we are not free to do as we want because we are the king's property. And we want to look a little bit into this one because if you look at the financial behavior of the church right now, which we don't really want to go into details, I can basically say with great confidence that almost every financial principle that Jesus has ever established, we have overstepped, we have broken, we have ignored it. In our ignorance, we have done the opposite and thought we are normal. No wonder we have hardly anything to say into the economic questions of this world. And if you look at the world around us, when they wake up in the morning until they go to bed at night, they worry about one thing and one thing only. Is there enough money? Do I work in such a way that I'm paid well enough and can I get more? It's a mindset driven by two spirits. By fear, will there be enough? Will I make it? And by greed, more is always better. If I have a million, what about two million? So the whole idea is driven by fear and by greed. And if Jesus speaks of mammon, I think he basically doesn't speak just of a financial system. He speaks of a demonic spirit. Think of mammon as the finance minister of Satan, <laughs> who is out there to give you a false gospel. If you have money, and if you have a job, you don't need God. 
because you can do what you want. He will tell you, I shop, therefore I am. <laughs> he will tell you that you have power to acquire because you have money in your pocket and you will feel powerful going into the supermarket. Many supermarkets become literally temples where you go and feel powerful in the religion of Mammon. But Mammon, after all, is a demon. And if you take a little bit of teaching of Jesus on demons, I would say they're like rats. You can chase them away and they will go away, but rats live of dirt. So if you don't clean away the dirt, the rats at some point will come again. And the problems with demons is never the demons. The problem is always the dirt, the reason why they're there in the first place. So therefore, the problem is not mammon, but how Christians have aligned their lifestyle with a materialistic mindset that basically makes them powerless against mammon. And that's why often their life and their message and their behavior is powerless against the world run by money. Now let us look a little bit into, into the system that God brought into this world in terms of economy. Well, maybe one little statistical detail I really want to give you because I found it interesting. There's a man called Professor David Barrett who measures everything that has to do with missions. We call him Professor of Missiometrics. And, um, and David has looked at the income system of Christians. And he has, for example, found out that the sum total income of all the Christians in the world in one given year is $270 billion. And that every year there is an income for all the mission agencies of the whole world together is around $18 billion. That is a number from the year 2003. But every year, church embedded crime, that means the embezzlement of church funds by church people, costs the whole church 19 billion of dollars every year and goes unpunished. That means more money is stolen from the church coffers every year than the entire income of all mission agencies of the whole world together. Isn't that at least interesting? And that amount, is, says, says David Barrett, is supposed to grow from, from 19 billion to 65 billion in the year 2025. So we are having a huge problem. The church steals from the church. And I think we need some situations like Ananias and Sapphira at some point to shock the church back into a reality that basically we are living a system, an economical system, that has, can I be blunt, nothing to do with the kingdom. It has everything to do with Mammon and Babylon. Christians relying on the very same things that non-Christians are relying. They want to become rich. They hear about Jesus and Peter and they decide, oh, I want Jesus as, um, as a junior, as a junior uh, staff in my company as well, who can make me rich so I can catch more fish just like Peter. And so it's all about me, 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 and how to build up me by using God to be my global universal financial servant. And that is not who God is. Let us look a little bit into the economical systems that we find in the Bible. Um, just look at, at, at three things. Number one, the creational aspects, which I find important because they define the legal situation in the kingdom. God has created the world, therefore it is his property, period. That means if you and I live on a, in a world that we don't own, we behave differently, which is an important insight, isn't it? You behave different with things that belong to other people than if you think they are your own. This world doesn't belong to us. Number two, God gave a garden over to Adam and Eve for a limited time. That means he gave them land titles, harvesting rights, water rights. And that made them rich because of the powerful potential of the seeds multiplying. But that's not the end of the story. The devil came in there and made Adam and Eve believe him over God. And that meant that the devil took Adam and Eve's place. He stole the land rights from them. And now God still owns everything. But the number two, the tenants of the land rights is not anymore Adam and Eve. It's the devil. And Adam and Eve now come number three. Why do I say that? Because when Jesus talks to Lucifer on that mountain, let's say in Luke chapter 4, then he talks to the devil, and the devil says, all these kingdoms have been given to me. And Jesus does not contradict that. And then the devil goes further and says, and I give them to whom I want. That means the one who distributes land rights today is not God. 
as religious as that sounds, but it is the devil. The whole world lies in the evil one. So the devil is the distributor of land rights, and he gives it to the people and the folks that he likes, which is typically bad people. And so you wonder why in the world are always the wrong people rich? Why are the bad people, the dictators, the mafiosi, why do they have all the goodies? And why are the good people having nothing? Hello, because we are squatterers in a world where the land rights, legally speaking, belong to the devil. That's the situation. But then, come, then comes number two, and it starts with Abraham. Abraham is a person that obviously loves God, follows God, sacrifices his own son. You know the story. And God is so excited that he says, because you were doing that, because you were living in self-abandon that you even give away your son. I am going to give you the nations and I will give you a land as inheritance. Eretz Israel. And you know the story that God gave them basically a piece of land in Palestine. But it didn't happen just like this. They had to go there and fight for it and win it back from the devil. Literally chase out those who were in there before in order to settle down. And it's a contested piece of land until today, as you all know. Because the devil and his demons are basically in outroar against this. They say, how dare you, God, give our land where we have the title to someone else? And God says, because he deserves it. Because he has demonstrated selfless surrender to the God in heaven. And it's not anymore about him. It's about me. Don't you see that? because he's able to sacrifice that. Therefore, I give land to him, whether you demons like it or not, in your face I'll do that. And that is the principle that is valid until today. Then comes Israel, finally lives in the land. And if you look at the Old Testament, or the Older Testament, as some call it rightly, uh, you find that God is giving Israel a most fascinating economical system. It's a system that if you obey it, you actually work less and earn more. You spend less time working, the Sabbath, the Jubilee, all these things. You let the land rest for a while. You have 19 days every year only for parties, you know, mm. festivals in Jerusalem. <laughs> plus, the, plus going up and down to Jerusalem, there is no highway today. There was no highway then. That means time-consuming uh, partying culture. That costs money. Partying costs money. And God has designed it in such a way that in Israel, their taxing systems, their giving systems, the harvesting systems was so good that they were unique on the planet. That all the people looked and economically speaking, they were surprised how these people who follow God work less. And they should be poorer than us, but they were actually richer. Why? Because God was factoring himself in there. He said, if you obey my commands, I will bless you. I will let it drain over you. There will be no poor amongst you. There will be no sickness of the Egyptians amongst you, the principle of Goshen, right? And there will be sustainability, we would call it today. Milk and honey will continue to flow. That's an amazing economic insight. It was amazing also that the Israelites did not obey that incredible, grandiose system. They knew it better than God, didn't obey their own fantastic systems, and they ended up in Babylon. And then comes the third economic attempt of God, and that is Jesus. Jesus comes and establishes a new empire, a new political reality, and brings him an entirely new system that is so revolutionary that communism and capitalism are no match to this one. Because basically, it's neither communism that Jesus brings, nor capitalism. It's what I call communism. We have everything in common. It is like a co-op with a trillionaire at the table where we share everything we have because we understand a very important principle. If God buys us through the blood of Jesus to become members of the kingdom of God, everything that God buys is completely owned by him. That means we belong to him completely. And if we belong to him completely, we cannot give him money that he does not already own already. So the idea of us humans that are being bought by God, giving God anything, is actually a joke. It's, it's the idea amongst many Christians that you should do tithing is actually a very funny principle. You don't even find in the Old Testament the idea that you should give 10%. There are at least three. If you look carefully, you find four systems of tithings in the Old Testament. Four, not one. So if at all you want to be a real Old Testament person, give four times a tithe. Plus, be, please be circumcised and have your own Levite. So if at all, go all the way. But in the New Testament, it's not about what we give to God, but what we keep for ourselves. 
after we have completely been bought by God, we cannot pay him back. We are owned and operated. Paul calls himself a bond slave. And which slave keeps back his money from his master? You tell me. Now, the interesting thing is that uh, basically Jesus was modeling an entirely new lifestyle for us in an economic sense. And this is an economic principle in the kingdom that almost everything in the kingdom grows in three phases. Like a kernel of wheat falls into the ground and it produces a little stem, then the full halm and then the full head uh, kernel of wheat. So it's like John writing to, I write to you children, I write to you men, I write to you fathers. It's Mark chapter 4, in the kingdom everything grows in three, I call it organic phases. Even Jesus, uh, Isaiah 9 verse 6, is being described, a child was uh, uh, born, a, a son was given, and we see him as eternal father. So you see him in three stages, child, son, father. Economically speaking, that is very interesting. Because when Jesus was a child, up until about 12, financially speaking, he was dependent on his two parents, Mary and Joseph and his father in heaven, who gave them provisions even for a long holiday in Egypt, where the people from the east came and gave money. And holidays in Egypt is costly today. It was costly then, so it was quite some money. So God provided, and Jesus was dependent. Then he became a businessman. He became a tecton, basically a, a building constructor. For 18 years, he was, a, he was a small businessman in a small town. And he wrote bills. And he probably, you know, uh, talked to people about paying those bills as well. So he was right smack at home in the world of business. For 18 years, that is almost 65% of his lifetime on earth, he was a businessman. And businessmen think different from people who are, having an em who are employees and who have just a job. They are being told what to do. A businessman gives other people a job. That requires a different type of thinking. But there was a time where Jesus was, during this time, salaried uh, before, and then he was earning money through the benefits and profits of his business. But then came a third phase. First phase was be a child, dependency. Second phase was be a businessman, independent. Third phase was when he said, farewell uh, business job, farewell uh, um, um, building, um, building uh, life, and welcome for your job in the kingdom where he was called an apostle and high priest of God. That doesn't mean that that business has nothing to do with the kingdom. Far from it. God is sending us into school to learn things. He's sending us into business to not only just go into business to earn, but to redefine life uh, in our specific area of business, where because we are kingdom people, we can do business in an entirely different way. And lastly, Jesus became an apostle, and now he needed to be financed yet again in a total different system. How did he live? Where does the money come from? And for example, Jesus drove out demons out of rich ladies and lived off their wealth. That's what it says in Luke chapter 8. He drove out demons of some of these ladies and they supported him out of their wealth. Well, that's at least one way. But let's look a little bit more strategic into how does finances work into the, in, in the kingdom? Where does the money come from? And just to be really brief here, the money comes from basically God's miraculous acts. When, 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 wine is, uh, when water is turned into wine, when the two fish and the five uh, loaves are multiplied, these kind of things, when Jesus will speak a prophetic word to a businessman, catch, cast your net to the right side and he catches a big catch, prophetic business advice, this is where money comes in. Number two, when people came into the kingdom, they usually came with everything they had and because they now had the kingdom, they had a social security, they had pension, they had a job security, because God basically says to them, I have work for you in the kingdom and I will pay for you, even beyond your pension age. <laughs> age. And so they came in there and if they brought debt, they brought debt and they cleared it all together. If they brought more than they had, the, uh, if they brought surplus, the Bible speaks of houses and fields were routinely sold and the money was laid at the apostles' feet. That is a kingdom entry payment, I call that. And thirdly, there was the gifts and proceedings and donations that those who were following Christ gave from their business, from their work. And fourthly and lastly, it is what we would call the Egyptian gold. That means the riches of this world that was transferred into the kingdom. The question number two is, who are the bankers in the kingdom? And the answer is quite simple. Acts 4.35, the money was laid before the apostles' feet. Which means a transparent public giving to a plurality of people. Not to one single person where you just stuff an envelope into the, 
into the pocket and you can control the person. No, no, it was a public dedicated giving to the apostolic people so that it became money with a mission. It became apostolic money. And it served the apostolic scattering purposes of the kingdom. And what was the money given for? Only briefly, it was given, number one, for the church's own poor and most vulnerable people. That's prioritized list. It was the widows and orphans who are part of the church. Galatians chapter 6. Number two, it was given to mom and dad, those who are spiritual parents, to invest into others. That means those people who invest into others, they are the ones who have been supposed to be paid. But in the kingdom, you don't have a salaried list. You don't get a monthly salary so you can, you know, become lazy and dependent. It is a daily wage system, if you wish. <coughs> and it's invested into people who don't do the work themselves, but to train others to do the work. And thirdly, they were basically used for apostolic projects. And fourthly and lastly, they were given to the poor of this world, to the orphans and widows of this world. Jesus once said, the poor you have always with you, and if you want, you can do good to them. Knowing full well that if you would just give money to the needy, we would be never having enough money. So Jesus was not need-driven. He was God-driven. And as a result of that, he introduced an entirely new system of life into this world. And um, today, we are experiencing a return to the insights of kingdom economics. And the moment you start uh, discovering this one, actually, it becomes a very explosive uh, economical system that we discover. I just make an example. I was in India in a, in a Domino's Pizza, I think, and I met a man who told me there's a young man who woke up with a dream in India, and he dreamt about a chemical formula. And when he experimented with it, he found out it was a formula for glue, a glue. It was so good, that glue, that he started a company called Jaibase Polymer, and he became one of the leading glue manufacturers of India and became so wealthy that he started to support church planners in India, which is a classical story of kingdom economics, and I think I can tell you thousands of these stories. We are going to see much more of these kind of things where kingdom people, because they are inspired by God, will become uh, prophetic business entrepreneurs because God gives them inventions and ideas that you have no idea how they will change the world. But then, friends, we have to have a financial system that isn't going to be corrupted by the idea that we're going to be very, very rich. We need to be almost be financial eunuchs <laughs> that can go into the harem full of money, untemptable by the riches of God. And that means we need to be dead to these kind of things and a life in Christ. That's what I want to share with you about kingdom economics. Is there something you would like to ask? Yes, I would want to ask. What is this dirt that you were talking about, and how can we get rid of it? Oh yeah, when I said about the rats? Yes. Well, quite simply, demons are a little bit like missionaries who have a visa. They can only work where they have been given permission. It's the legal rights, the reason why they are there. And if we as Christians follow the same system of a Babylonian system, we align ourselves so much with the Babylonian system of this world that the devil says, we think we can establish an embassy in that person. <laughs> we have a legal right to establish a presence, to control that person in the area of money, greed, or fear. And the way to deal with it is to go to God and ask forgiveness, come to the cross, and ask Jesus to relinquish and release us from this kind of dirt and rip apart the rental contracts for these demonic beings and say, go in the name of Jesus and drink a coffee and live happily ever after in the kingdom. <laughs> Be fruitful. Multiply.